Jesus made that all possible that we could enjoy the presence of Almighty God in our lives. But there's a big role that you have to play in enjoying the presence of God and participating in the presence of God. And so I want to talk a little bit about that today. If you turn in your Bibles with me to the first book of Peter, My daughter said, are you going to be funny today? I said, no, I'll leave the funny to mum. First book of Peter. I don't have one funny line in my notes. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> First book of Peter in chapter 2. A scripture that most of us think uh, for when you start off your Christian life. Let's start from verse 1, because I love verse 1. That really makes people squirm a little bit. Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking. Let's go to verse 2. As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. Everybody say grow. Grow. That's what God expects us to do, is to grow in our Christian walk, to grow in our life with Jesus, to grow from being a spiritual infant to being a mature person in God. And I know everyone thinks they're mature, right? And, uh, <laughs> but we need to grow. We all got to see ourselves back here as newborn babes desiring the pure milk of the word. Sin does not get easier as you grow, Bruce said. Hmm. It actually gets harder. Why is that? Well, when you first become a Christian, uh, it's quite easy unloading some of the junk out of your life. Some of the, the big rocks, the big boulders that have been slowing us down. It's easy to offload them. For some, it's easy. Okay? But once you've got rid of the big rocks, then you've got to start getting rid of the smaller stuff and the smaller stuff. And then when just as you think that I've just about made this, God switches the light on. And you go, oh my goodness, is that how far I've got to go? And it's good to see how far people have come, but we've all got, always got to remember we've, we've still got a long way to go, right? Every single one of us. <clears throat> a Christian's life starts with a spiritual birth. We all start the same. And no matter where you come from, whether you were, were born in the slums of Bombay or in, in the quite extensive life that we have here in Western Australia, whether you was born with dark-coloured skin or light-coloured skin, where no matter what continent you were born on, when you come to Jesus, we all come and we all start the same way. You, I've seen people come to Jesus who have been so educated, have uh, more degrees than a thermometer, and... <coughs> <coughs> that was a funny one, just for you. <coughs> Yet when they come to Jesus, they have to come and start right back down there to the same level as the person who never even went to school. And if they think, if you ever think that you've got to jump on things because of your education, you're, you're greatly deceived. Because some of the greatest people of God that have grown up and done a mighty, mighty deeds for God were uneducated people. Our great brother in India, James Jacob, never went beyond uh, seven years old at school. So he never really learned to read and write. Okay? And uh, today, he's, we just spoke to him over the last couple of days. He's in the Middle East at the moment because uh, the rains are coming in India. So he uses that time to go over and try to uh, get some resources for the ministry. All right? And in the Middle East, they've got plenty of money, right? So it's a good place to, to be. He's doing a series of meetings over there. But never got past... Seven years old, not grade seven, seven years old in school. And by the, by the age of eight, he was living on the streets in the city of Madurai. 
and uh, today he speaks over 26 different languages and uh, he still can't uh, type on a computer. He still has struggles to write, but he can read his Bible, okay? And he's got a God-given gift of many great things. Don't let your lack of education stop you from doing what God wants you to do. Now, if you, it's good to be educated, and all you kids who are still in school here, it don't give you option to opt out and just go, God will take over, right? But when we work hard, God will fill in. So we all start the same. Until you experience this born-again birth from above, you dwell in spiritual death. Did you know that? You was walking around, but you was dead in your spirit. You had all the potential to be everything that God wanted you to be. It's like an unfertilized egg. It's got all the potential there. But when you get born again, everything comes alive. If you're here this morning, I don't know where you're at with Jesus. <clears throat> you could have been sitting in here for the last 10 years. I still don't know where you're at with Jesus. Okay? But to get born again, you need the Bible te teaches us that we need to come to Jesus and accept him as the Lord of our life. And we need to ask him to forgive us of our sin. It's no good thinking it. It's no good wanting it. We've got to ask for it. It's as simple as that. No matter what your past is like, God will forgive you if you ask him to. The Bible says that he died for the whole world. So every man, woman and child can be saved. But they have to receive. I like Lynn Jones here the other Sunday night when she had that big bowl of chocolates. <clears throat> if anyone would come and take this, they can have it. Hmm. You're the chocoholics. And one came and took it. She said, that is grace. That is faith in action. And that is what salvation is about. Coming to receive from Jesus. He said, if any would come. Didn't he say that? Come. If any would come. And we need to come to him. But once we get saved, and I started my message last week by saying that there's being saved and there's living in Jesus. And it's this development of Knowing the presence of God, once we get saved, we take this little boy over here who's asleep on his mummy's lap. And uh, he's not that old, okay? And so he's been born. He's there right in her presence right now. But, you know, it's had to be nurtured. And he's enjoying the presence of the one who's looking after him. I wonder sometimes whether we really enjoy the presence of God who's looking after us because that relationship has got to be nurtured and it can be built. In the natural, there are so many things that are detrimental to our growth in the natural, right? I'm not even going to go there and name them because you're going to be involved in some of them. And uh, things that we do partake of in life, things that we eat, things that we drink, things that we we go out and do, they're detrimental to our, our health and detrimental to our growth. I was, I was told, don't start smoking, it will stunt your growth. Was you told that? <laughs> it probably did, I should have been six foot eight. <laughs> okay. and, uh, but there are things, but it's the same in the spirit. There's things that we can partake of that will, is detrimental to our spiritual growth. And so many times I see Christians who are struggling year after year after year, 20 years on, they're still falling over the same old stuff and still never progressed past the first year that they got born again. And God doesn't want it that way. God wants us to grow into maturity. And we would be wise to recognize the things that hinder our growth. Amen? So if you read the Bible, you will find out the things that hinder your growth. In fact, you actually go, have to go a little bit deeper than reading your Bible. You need to study your Bible. You need to take the scripture and find out what it means to you today. 
You need to cross-reference. You need to know what God is talking about. You need to get it into context. You need to read the bit before and the bit after. You need to study your word. And then you would know what is good for you and what's not good for you. But you need to go a step more than that that when you find out what's good for you and what's not good for you, that are the things you're supposed to do. Okay? Do the things that are good for you. Don't do the things that are harmful to you. And you will grow into maturity in God. And when you start to reach a, a stage of maturity in the Lord and you, you're enjoying <coughs> His presence, excuse me, you will benefit by the blessings of God over your life. There's no doubt about it. I was uh, talking to a young man the other day. We had a, a good chat for a long, long time. And, uh, I, and I was saying, you know, where I am today is because of the things and the choices that I made more than 20 years ago. The, I didn't make those choices last year and arrive here today. I've had to make those choices a long time ago and stick with it. I'm not going to do this, I'm going to do this. I'm not going to go there, I'm going to go here. I'm not going to read that, I'm going to read this. I'm not going to look at that, I'm going to watch this. I'm not going to listen to that, I'm going to listen to this. I'm not going to go there, you, you get my drift? You know what I mean? So that's, that's over a long period of time that we have to do this. So when you come to Jesus and you start to do the right thing, don't wonder why things are not quite happening for you yet. You've got to continue in the way. Continue in the way. I remember back, I was, I was a Christian about, for about seven years at the, that stage, and, and uh, I couldn't make out why my life weren't getting better. Well, I was still half living in the world and still half living in the Lord and going to church. I was going to church every week, and, uh, but going to church every week, don't cut it. They don't, it won't make it for you. Okay. Now, it's good to go to church every week. The Bible tells us we should do. Okay? And it will be beneficial for you in the long term if, you're a, if, if you consistently uh, are in the assembly of God okay? and, uh, and, and worship in corporately with your brothers and sisters. But it doesn't guarantee because you can go to church and you can walk out of that door and you can live a totally different life. I love that song this morning. And uh, I only sung it a couple of times. And you're all, all I want is all you are. Is that what it says? All I want is all you are, Sundays. <laughs> is that right? <laughs> That's a funny. It says always, always. Sundays or some days. No, always. Always. Where are we going? The title of my message today comes from an old saying that my mum used to say many, many years ago. And it's, and it's titled, Better the Devil You Know. Better the devil you know than the one you don't. Okay? And I think that's... I used to think that was a really strange saying. And when I first became a Christian, I used to think, what is my mum talking about the devil for? But she was right. Because the Bible teaches us his strategies and his ways to stop the growth in our life. Amen? So it's better that the devil you know is the one God is talking about in this Bible. And then you will know how to overcome his ways. If we didn't know him and we didn't know his ways, he would be tripping us up every day. But we can't use that as an excuse because we have the word of God. And if you don't read it, you won't know what he's about. 2 Corinthians 2.11, Paul says this, lest Satan takes advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. You will be if you don't read your Bible. You will be if you don't listen to good sermons. You will be if you don't go to church on a regular basis and have an input of God's Word. You will, be, you will not know how the devil works in your life. And you'll be going, why did that happen? Who did that? 
But you will know, I know where that's coming from. I know what this situation is about. This is what the Bible says. Paul goes on to say to the church in Ephesus in chapter 6 verse 11, he says, put on the whole armour of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil or the schemes or the strategies of the enemy. Amen? And uh, we continue to fall in, the, in certain areas in our life because we haven't done our homework. When, you, when, a, when a, a sport team or a, a sportsman or woman goes into competition with someone, they work out their opponent. They, do it, they plan. They know the strengths of their opponents. They know the weaknesses of their opponents. We would be wise to do the same thing. So, let me share with you this morning, for a little while, that was funny too. <laughs> some areas, I won't say how many, because you might all get up and go home already. Some areas that disadvantage us to grow in God, or hinders our growth in God. And there are areas that you might think, oh, well, I know that, but I wonder if you really do. We'll jump straight in to Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. We have a fallen nature that makes it very difficult for spiritual growth. Your fallen nature, see, when you got born again, your spirit got born again. You are a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in a body, okay? Your spirit got born again, your, your flesh nature didn't get born again. It is still sinful, but it's not an excuse. You can't have that as an excuse. We are all sinners, we all start the same way, and there's a battle that goes on. We talked about this briefly at our home group on Wednesday night, between your spirit and your flesh for the occupation of your soul. Your soul be in the area of your mind, your will, your emotions. Okay? So your spirit wants to dominate your life. Your born again spirit wants to lead your life. But your sinful flesh wants to also lead your life. Amen? And uh, there's a dilemma here. <clears throat> and I want to read <clears throat> from the Message Bible this morning Paul's explanation of this dilemma. I'm reading it from the Message Bible it's a <clears throat> because it's very easy to understand. I used to understand this in the old King James, and, uh, but I struggled with this. And when I read this in the Message Bible, it totally made sense. And I think this is going to make sense to you this morning. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says about this dilemma of, of growth, of spiritual growth in his life because of the hindrance of his flesh. I can anticipate the response that is coming. I know that all God's commands are spiritual, but I'm not. This is Paul speaking, not me, right? Isn't this also your experience? Yes, I'm full of myself. After all, I've spent a long time in sin's prison. What I don't understand about myself is that I decide one way and then I act another, doing things I absolutely despise. So if I can be trusted to figure out, if I can't be trusted to figure out what is best for myself and then do it, it becomes obvious that God's command is necessary. Okay? He's saying, I can't work this out. I better get somebody to tell me how to do it. But I need something more. For if I know the law but, can't still, but still can't keep it, and if the power of sin within me keep sabotaging my best intentions, I obviously need help. I realize that I don't have what it takes. When I, when I find people like Paul writing this, like I go, thank God there's somebody else who, who, was, who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, struggled in the same way as I did, or I am. Okay? He says, I can, I can will it, but I can't do it. 
I decide to do good, but I don't really do it. I decide not to do bad, then I do it anyway. Is someone listening to me this morning? My decisions, such as they are, don't result in actions. Something has gone wrong deep within me, and it gets the better of me every time. It happens so regularly that it's predictable. <laughs> the moment I decide to do good, sin is there to trip me up. Isn't that the truth? <clears throat> I truly delight in God's commands, but it's pretty obvious that not all of me joins in that delight. <laughs> Parts of me, I could just preach this. Parts of me covertly rebel. And just when I least expect it, they take charge. I've tried everything and nothing helps. I'm at the end of my rope. Is there no one who can do anything for me? Isn't that the real question? He goes on to say, the answer, thank God, is that Jesus Christ can and does. He can do it for me and he does do it for me. He acted to set things right in this life of contradictions where I want to serve God with all my heart and mind, but I'm pulled by the influences of sin to do something totally different. He said, what, what it says in the King James, this sinful flesh, is there, is there no one that can help me? But I thank God that Jesus Christ has he, what he's saying, he, he's actually describing how the battle that goes on in his life right here between the flesh and the spirit. I won't even ask you to put your hand up this morning if you agree with that or have experienced that because if you didn't, I think that you're more problem than you know you are. Thank God that Jesus, about Jesus Christ. Amen? <laughs> What he's saying is, you feel like this, you have no excuse. And Jesus has already overcome for you. And if you put your trust in him, and if you're waiting on him, he will do the work in you. The biggest problem is, like I said last week with Abraham, he got the promise of God and then tried to go do the promise of God himself. Okay? That's us. We're trying to do it in our own flesh and in our own flesh we'll stop the growth of our spirit. Get into Jesus. He is the only way that you will overcome this flesh. We have no excuse if we have Jesus as resident in our life. Now if you're here this morning and Jesus has never been made the Lord of your life, you, you have no help in that area. You have no hope to overcome this. You need Jesus. The second thing which will stop us from growing in God, and you need to listen to these things really carefully this morning, because if you want to grow, you will grow. Okay? One thing that prevents our spiritual growth is poor listening habits. Poor listening. Poor listening to God, poor listening to the preacher, poor listening to your the word when you're reading it. Poor listening to things that are happening around your life. If I call it selective hearing. I have selective hearing at home. If Jane asks me to do something I don't want to do, I can actually pretend that I didn't hear her. And uh, I've owned up to that. Haven't done it for a long time. Yesterday morning was the last one, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Turn with me to the book of Matthew. You probably reckon you know it in your kids. They have selective hearing. But you do too. Amen? When you read the Word of God and you read something you don't like, you just read faster. Is that right? Turn over. I actually... It's not this Bible, but another Bible. I was, I was preaching on this same subject once and I turned to the to one of the pages of the Bible and I said, you know, I don't like these scriptures and I tore the page out and I put it in my pocket. I tore the page out of my Bible, okay? And all the religious people went, oh, sacrilege. 
He's tore his Bible. He's going to hell now. <laughs> now I'm going to Kurong to buy a new one. Okay? Are you turned there. Matthew 13. Let me just read the first nine verses. On the same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea, and great multitudes were gathered together to him, so that he got into a boat and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. And he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow. And he sowed, some, and, he sowed and some seed fell on the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth and they, be, and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. Uh, but when the sun was up, they were scorched and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns and the thorn, thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Are you hearing this morning? When I'm reading this scripture, you need to go, which I need God to speak to me on this area because I want a growth in my life which is a hundredfold. I don't mind, you know, I'd be happy with 60-fold. I wouldn't even mind 30-fold. But God's best is for a hundredfold growth in your life. In the parable of the sower, Jesus illustrates how the farmer sows his seeds in various kinds of soil. And then he says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Different people hear and respond to the word of God differently. Only the person who really hears and responds will have a full harvest. Amen. We need to listen to what God is saying to us and do it. Are you a wayside hearer this morning? Do you refuse to let God's word penetrate your heart and produce the desired effect? Or does it just, see the wayside was the path, it was well trodden, it was hard ground and the seed just bounced off, it would be like me throwing it onto this vinyl. It would just scatter, it wouldn't get into the soil. And sometimes when the word is coming out, sometimes we sit there, if you're on Facebook right now, you're a wayside hearer. If you're reading your emails right now, you're a wayside hearer. If you've got your phone on and you're looking at it with anything other than your Bible verses that I'm reading, you're a wayside hearer. The word has come to you. It's bounced off you. You need to get saved. Okay? You need to get saved. You need to give your life to Jesus. Ask him to fill you with his Holy Spirit that he would soften your life that the seed would get in. You've hardened your heart. That's a wayside hearer. Oh, that's not funny, Pastor. Are you a rocky ground hearer? Do you allow God's word to enter your heart, but only in a superficial way? That means you listen to it, okay, but there's, there's no depth in your life. You hear the word, and by the time you've, got, you've made your first cup of coffee out there, it's gone, okay? It's totally gone. Do you let the cares of the world choke out the word of God? Does your desire to get ahead in the world cause you to be unfruitful? That's the cares of the world. Well, you know, I can't go to church because if I, I, I've, got to get, I've got to go to this job and I've got to go to that job and I can't get here and I can't get there. I, work is more important to me than getting to church. Now, I know in the day we live in, in the 21st century, we're extended trading hours and Sunday trading. It's a, it's a work in the, of the devil. Let me tell you this right now this morning. To keep God's people out of church. Out of church. Robert went for a job the other week and he said to them, I can work all the hours you want from Monday to Saturday, but I ain't working Sunday. And most employers would go, he's a bit demanding, isn't he? But he got the job. And God will bless you, young man. He will bless you in that. I know that things are slow taken off right now. But I see your life as, as on a, a new runway of life. And at the moment, the wheels are not even off the ground. You're, even, you're not even out of first gear yet for what God wants to do in your life at this time. And uh, you've made a new start. You've changed, the, you've changed your airline. And uh, you're about to take off. And that runway seems like a long way down to the end there but you ain't even got your head pressed back into the seat yet. You haven't felt the thrust of God's uh, anointing upon your life. 
but hang in there, don't get off yet, because you are moving. And I'll tell you, within the next 12 months, your life is going to look so different as the wheels take off the end of that runway and you start to enter into things you never dreamed of before. Amen? Be faithful and stay on board. Number three. So number two was you've got to listen properly. If you want to grow in God, the reason you're still at the same place as you was 20 years ago is because you don't listen. Yeah. James went on to say, but no good just being a hearer. You've got to take what you hear and do. Amen? Number three. 1 John 2, verses 15 and 16. Turn there with me. 1 John. Go to the back of the book if you want and work backwards. Do not love this world or the things of this world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of this world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Another thing that will hinder your growth is simply the evil world that we live in if we partake of it if we partake of it. And Jesus said in this great prayer of, uh, in John 17, he said, Father, I pray for these who are here. And they're thinking, wow, Jesus is praying for us. Did you know he prayed for you in that chapter too? And he said, Father, I don't pray that you take them out of this world, but you be with them in it. And the Bible says we're in this world, but we're not of this world. If you partake of the evil that's in this world, this world system, he's talking about, and when he talks about the world, he's talking about the society around us that ignores God and rebels against him. The world puts a great emphasis on material wealth, which perishes, but John urges his readers to think about and live for those things which abide forever, those things which are eternal. Ask yourself this, when you're involved in something, is, is, there, is God involved in this with me? Is, is this eventually going to bring glory to God? You know, don't give up your day job simply because it's an evil environment. You need to work because you're shining a light in the darkness. Don't become part of the darkness, be the light. And you will grow in God. You know, it's so easy when you're the, sometimes when you're the only Christian in that place is to, to slip into their ways. You know, the things that start to come out of your life, it's just because you don't want to stand out. You stand out anyway. So make a stand and let your light shine. You don't have to preach to them. Just be different. Just be different to them. You don't have to tell dirty jokes to be part of what they do. You don't have to use bad language so that they accept you. You don't have to do these things. Just be different. Just be different. Amen? Don't let this evil world drag you down. Number four, 1 Peter 5, 8. 5, 8. Come on, you know these scriptures. Be sober. Oh, I'm not getting into drink today. Be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. The devil himself is a hindrance to your spiritual growth. But Jesus said, fear not, for I have overcome this world. And he overcame the devil on the cross at Calvary. Amen? He's like a roaring lion. He is not a roaring lion. The next lion you will hear roar will be the lion of the tribe of Judah when he comes back for us. And the devil's an imitator. And he will try to scare you. Those who ignore or joke about the devil are deceiving themselves. The world does this. They dress him up with horns and tails and a pitchfork, right? He will never come to you like that. 
He will come to you with a smiling face. Amen? He will come to you with promises beyond your imagination. Satan's greatest deception actually is for man to believe that he doesn't really exist. Because if you don't believe he exists, you don't know who you're fighting. Is that right? Paul says, I don't swing and miss like one who's punching at the air. I had a brother who was four years older than me and quite bigger and he used to hold me out there my head and I would be going, I'm going to kill you when my arms get longer. <laughs> I, but this is how I see Christians fight. They don't know who they're fighting. Someone says something to them, look sideways at them, don't say good morning to them. They've got a problem with them. Come on. Get beyond people. The Bible says that our fight is not against flesh and blood. Amen? The devil's out there. He's got no power. Did you know that? Jesus, not only when he died for us, he not only freed us from the penalty that sin was going to put on us, which was death, but he freed us from the power of sin. We don't have to put up with this rubbish anymore. We can, we can walk away from the wiles of the devil. Two more left, okay? Number five. This is really going to get you. This word procrastination. I'll talk about it next week. <laughs> Put off till tomorrow, it means. Procrastination is, will hinder your spiritual life will hinder your growth in God. Let me show you what I... I don't mean just, guys, you was going to do the gardening today, but you're going to do it tomorrow. That's not what I'm talking about. Okay? Although your wife will say, I wish he said to do it today. <laughs> Get a garden like mine. No one has to do it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Procrastination is a big word and it gets us into big trouble. See, each believer is responsible for, the, for overcoming the, the objects and the hindrances that stop their spiritual growth. Okay? The reason I use this word, because if, if we neglect the means to grow and we put off the opportunities for growth, this is putting it off, if we put off the opportunities to grow for another time when I'm older, I'll do it when I'm old. I'll do it when I'm old like you, Pastor. You know, you don't expect me to do that. You don't want to live. Well, I was young once too and I thought I was living until I found Jesus. And then I realized I was dying. I didn't know what life was until I met Jesus. You probably look at my life back then and went, wow, he could party. I was dying dying. If we neglect the opportunities for growth provided for us by God and by the church, we will remain babies in the Lord. The children of Israel remained in the wilderness because of their excessive complaining, never wanting to go forward, never grasping the opportunities. God had laid in front of them the opportunity to go into Canaan a land of promise, and they never grasped a hold. They always looking back, and they never went forward and took the opportunity that God you, you had given to them. God gave them the opportunity to live in a whole new land, flowing with milk and honey. Was it? it just means like there's abundance of everything there. And many of us are sitting in here and God has given us the opportunity to live in the fullness of the abundance that Jesus died for, yet we don't take it. Maybe when I'm a bit older. Maybe when I got my life right. That's what uh, Lynn Jones was saying the other week, right? When are you going to come to Jesus? When are you going to give it all to Jesus? When I'm worthy, when I've got my life right. 
when I got my mortgage paid, when my kids have left school, when I'm done this, when I, when I get married, when I'm not married, whatever, <laughs> you know. We've always got an excuse for not going forward. We've always got an excuse for not taking the next step. We've always got an excuse not to grasp a hold of the opportunities that God has given us. Last one. I'm going to get into you now. The poor example of others will hinder our spiritual growth. The poor example of others. Who, who is around your life that is showing you a poor example? Do you know this morning I stood there watching up on the stage and David is playing guitar and his sons are there on the stage. Diane is worshipping God and her daughter is standing worshipping next to her. And I thought, what an example. What a fantastic example to set as a parent is, is doing the things of God, grasping hold of the opportunities that he's given them. And, uh, and as these kids grow, you know, they, they do go through a tough time when they're teenagers, I know. But, you know, overall they're going to see... They set the example. Yeah. Yeah. So what people around your life, we must always be alert. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. My kids had to learn this off by heart. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Amen? Who are you hanging out with that's dragging you down? That's stopping you from growing. Who are you talking to in the week? I know that it's good to go visit people and stuff, especially people who are not in church, but do you lift them up or do they drag you down? Do you get into their gossip or do you pull, or pull them up with your positive talk? We must always be alert and, uh, so that the faults and the actions of others do not hinder our spiritual walk. We're not responsible for the actions of others, but we're responsible for our own actions. Bad company corrupts good morals. <laughs> There's one thing that I always notice. When one of our kids go astray, we always go, they're a good boy or good girl. It's those they're hanging out with. Is that right? <laughs> they just got into bad company. They just had a wrong circle of friends. <laughs> but every parent of every kid in that circle of friends said their son was in, or daughter was in the wrong circle of friends. And your kid was in that circle too. So pry them out of that circle. Pray that their friends get a job overseas somewhere. Okay? Do you know prayer works? You can pray that. Pray it over their lives. Hmm. Always bad company corrupts good morals. If you're a Christian, be careful. I, I said this many times. When you watch a sad movie, it makes you cry. Come on, guys. Okay? You watch a funny movie, it makes you laugh, all right? You watch a horror movie, ah, you're scared. You watch a violent movie, it will make you violent. You hang out with bad people, it will make you bad, okay? Be careful. Don't, I don't want you bringing all your friends up this afternoon going, Pastor said I can't come visit you, you're horrible. You're a bad person. <laughs> Just be aware when you go to somewhere, when you're visiting someone's home, when you're going to see friends or whatever, or even parents, even going to visit your kids, pray before you go. God, give me strength to keep this conversation positive. Not, don't let me be drawn into this, Lord. Okay? Always gravitate to the positive. Okay, so you need to grow in God. In the, in the natural, you grow 
when you eat good food. No one can do your eating for you. You know, it's no good pushing your dinner over to your space and say, you eat that for me tonight. They're going to grow and you're not going to grow. No one can do your reading for you. Okay, when you're little, before you can read, it's good parents to get in and read the Bible to your children. But you've got to teach your children to read the Bible for themselves. And if you're here today and you don't read your Bible, the Word of God is, going to, is food for your spirit. It's going, to, it's going to be growth to your spirit. If you don't read your Bible, you're not going to grow. In 20 years' time, you're still going to be sitting in the same chair doing the same thing. Loving Jesus, yeah, but you're just not going to grow. So you're not going to enter in to the things that God wants for the mature. He has got, he has got things for the mature. And as we grow, we get these other things. If you've got a child and uh, you're not going to, when that child's little, you're not going to let them have certain things. If that child never grows, they're always going to remain playing with the same toys, doing the same things. We need to grow. Amen? No one can do your sleeping for you. Wouldn't that be nice? Can you just go, go and have a sleep for me for a few hours? I'm, I'm so busy I can't afford to sleep. No one can do your learning for you. No one can do your growing for you. I cannot pray for you for spiritual growth. It doesn't come that way. I can pray that God would do a miracle in your life, that God would... But sometimes you've got to be careful with saying, God, whatever it takes, I'm not even going to go there. Amen? Be careful what's detrimental to your spiritual growth. I want you to remember this today. I hope you've been listening. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I thank you this day in the name of Jesus. You've called us all to go on this journey from being born again as spiritual babes to this place of maturity, lacking nothing. And God, I pray for this church community. I pray, God, that your spirit would take these words today and would get them deep on the inside of people's lives that we might grow by the pure milk of the word of God that has been preached here this morning. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's have our music team back, sing one more song before we go today.